Before we get into today's video, I do want to let you guys know that this video is for educational purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance in hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, y'all already know, uh, y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. I hope everybody is getting geared up for a wonderful Christmas. Today is the 22nd, which means hopefully everybody's gonna have a long, wonderful weekend doing something valuable or important to you, like being with your family or being with your animals or just spending some time alone. I hope that everybody has a very, very, very Merry Christmas. And yeah, so in today's video, we are going to be talking about the case of Larry Hall. And this is a highly requested case and there are so many twists and turns in this case. So I'm gonna do like I typically do. I'm gonna tell you guys the whole entire story from the best of my ability, from the public information that is already out there. And at the end of the video, I'm gonna give you guys more of my opinions on things and all of that. So let's just start at the beginning. Larry Dwayne Hall was born on December 11th, 1962 in Wabash, Indiana. His parents are Robert Hall, who was a grave digger at a cemetery, and his mother's name is Era Hall, who was a homemaker or what we would call like a stay-at-home mom. Now, when Larry was born, he spent the first few days of his life in a NICU unit because of lack of oxygen because his fraternal twin brother, Gary, was basically feeding off of him. I'm not a professional. You guys go do your own research, please, but it's when you have two fraternal twins and one of them is basically taking all the nutrients and sucking it uh, like from the other fetus and so this is what happened between Larry and Gary so they were twins and Gary basically got all of the good stuff and so when the two were born Larry had to go into the NICU unit. Now, Larry did recover and he grew up and he went on to attend West Ward Elementary School with his brother, Gary. However, people that knew them said that Larry was already displaying like antisocial behaviors and he was struggling to keep up with his peers academically. People around him even said that he had a low IQ. And it was also said that Larry was teased and bullied a lot for his obvious differences, as well as for his frequent night terrors. He had speech impediments and bedwetting. Now, Larry, being a fraternal twin with his brother, Gary, was compared to his brother, Gary, constantly. And you hear about this a lot with twins um, and obviously not every twin situation, but you do hear about it a lot where, you, where you'll have a, a set of twins and they're either always looked at as one person and they sometimes can have issues with growing up and feeling like an individual, or sometimes you have a twin situation where they're constantly being compared to each other. And this is what seemed like happened between Larry and Gary. Now, Gary was always very protective of his brother, Larry, because Larry was, again, socially awkward. He hung out with what his brother Gary said was the stinky kids. Like, he was like, he was in the stinky kids. He was the underdog. Nobody really wanted to hang out with him. He never had a girlfriend. Girls never talked to him, although he wanted a girlfriend. He wanted to be around girls, but he just was never that type. He also was not academic at all all he didn't play good sports he didn't make good grades and he was always compared to his brother gary who did play sports who did make decent grades now the two boys grew up basically in a graveyard which that alone to me would be like uh-uh 
But because their father was a grave digger for the cemetery, the cemetery allowed them, Larry, his twin brother, and mother and father, to live in a house that was on the cemetery grounds. So they basically got to live there for free because their father was the grave digger. Now, Larry began to dig graves when he was 12 years old to help his father. So now, not only does he have all this awkwardness going on, and by the way, Socially awkwardness, it's completely normal. I'm definitely not trying to talk about him in a negative way. I'm trying to tell this story because a lot of us have had some struggles when we're growing up. Matter of fact, most of us, pretty much all of us, right? When we're kids, there's awkwardness. But nevertheless, not only did he have all these other issues, but now he's spending his time with his father digging graves. And this is where people say that Larry became so comfortable around deceased bodies. It was even said that he would steal like jewelry and valuables off of the bodies before him and his father would put the people in their graves, which is absolutely horrible. Neighbors that knew the family said that their mother was very overbearing. She was super protective, basically did everything for the boys and, you know, didn't, didn't let them do anything for themselves. And then the father was a severe alcoholic. As a matter of fact, he ended up losing his job as a grave digger because he was drinking so much that he was putting the wrong people in the wrong graves. Yes, when he lost his job because he was putting the wrong people in the wrong graves, this is when the whole family had to move out of the house that they had been living in, basically for free for so long. And the four of them moved into what could be described as a little shack, a one bedroom shack. Now, not only did Larry struggle in school, didn't really have any friends. His brother Gary said that he never had any romantic relationships growing up, but Larry also had a very bad habit of lying. People said that he would lie just to lie and that it was like he would lie to you just to get a reaction out of you. He would make up stories just to try to impress people. But then also sometimes you would just, you, when you talk to him, you never knew if it was the truth. It's almost like he would sprinkle the truth into a lie to try to see if people could figure out what was the truth and what was a lie. Also, according to his brother Gary, he tried to be a positive influence on his brother Larry because he was basically everything that his brother Larry Larry, like wasn't and even though he tried to be a positive influence to his brother Larry they could just never really become close because of all these other issues that Larry had and then the lying too mind you guys the boys were born in the early 1960s so they grew up in the 60s and 70s and by the time both of the boys were 15 years old they started to get into trouble they were out you know being little hoodlums in the neighborhood and Larry even got arrested for busting a window out of a store in a downtown area. And it was also suspected that Larry committed multiple acts of arson, burglary, and he committed other little minor crimes while he was growing up. After high school, Larry got a job as a janitor and he began to travel around the U.S. and was like participating in these American Civil War reenactments. And I had never... I mean, I guess I had seen stuff like this before, but I didn't really know what it was. And I looked into it and it's where people from all over dress up as people from Civil War days and they bring their kids and their animals and they go out and meet in different places of the United States and they reenact the Civil War. Gary, Larry's brother, would later say that he thinks that Larry's Civil War reenactments were just a way for Larry to cover up the fact that he had poor personal hygiene and act out his violent fantasies. Larry could never get a, a romantic partner or be in a relationship, and he had these like deep fantasies. Well, the fantasies grew over time, and they became fantasies in an intimate or a sexual nature, and then they went into like these violent fantasies along with all of that. So his brother would later say that he believed him going to these war reenactments was ways for him to basically like get his fix. The FBI would say that they believe that around the 1980s is when Larry began to actually act out these violent fantasies that he had. And this is when they suspect that he began to 
people. The FBI also believed that when Larry would attend these like war reenactments, so there would be, again, there'd be in different places all over the United States. They would meet in this town and this state. They would meet in this town and this state. They believed that Larry began to go to these Civil War reenactments. And while he was in town for these reenactments, that he would go to nearby towns and select victims. And he would abduct mainly young girls or younger women who were walking by themselves, riding a bike. Again, this is, at this point, they're believing the 1980s. I mean, people send their kids to, to the store to, to bring them a pack of cigarettes back. You know what I mean? Like it was normal for little kids or younger teenagers or definitely young adults to walk by themselves. The FBI also believed that Larry, when he would go to these other towns for these reenactments and he would find somebody walking alone or by themselves. He, they believe that he would take them, pull them into his van, that he would rape them and he would stab and strangle them and kill them and dispose of their bodies. Over the next decade, several female bodies, some young and unidentified were discovered and later attributed to Larry due to their bodies being found in the way that they believed Larry left bodies like strangled and muted and body parts being used. However, the exact details of Larry's life and crimes haven't been widely publicized, even though he may be one of the most prolific serial killers in American history. See, in September of 1993, there was a case of a missing girl and her name was Jessica Roach and she was in Georgetown, Illinois. This was the exact case that put Larry on the police's radar because they weren't even thinking about him, okay? This is just some random guy in a van that works as a janitor at times and goes to these Civil War reenactments and doesn't have any friends and doesn't have any relationships. They didn't even know he existed until 15-year-old Jessica Roach went missing. Jessica was last seen riding her bicycle near her home. Two months later, her body was found in a cornfield in Indiana. Witnesses say that they saw a strange van driving through the cornfield around the same time that Jessica's body was found. And then later, witnesses were able to provide these investigators with a license plate number, and that license plate number is what tracked them back to Larry. Now, what was even stranger to the investigators was that another teenager named Trisha Lynn Reitler had disappeared about six months before Jessica, and the two cases were so similar. On March 29th, 1993, 19-year-old Trisha had been in the middle of writing a term paper when she decided to leave her dorm and go to the store that was only about a half of a mile away, and she was just going to buy a soda and a magazine. However, she never returned to her dorm. The police believe that Trisha was snatched while she was on her walk back from the store, and her parents believe that she was killed that night. However, Trisha's body was never found. Now, it was reported that Larry had been watching women outside of the store that Trisha shopped at that night. So there were people that saw his van sitting out there just like watching women shopping in the store. So now the investigators are realizing, okay, we've got this van placed in two different areas where two different young girls go missing. The investigators, again, they had never heard of Larry before his vehicle was linked to Jessica's disappearance. So when they heard that he was outside the same store that Trisha shopped at before she went missing, this is what gave the investigators the evidence that they needed to connect Larry to the scene of at least one of these disappearances. So they ended up going and getting Larry and they brought him in for questioning. Now, when Larry sat down, I want y'all to remember what I told y'all at the beginning of this video, because when they sat down and they began to question him, they could not believe what Larry told them. He started to confess. The first thing the investigators say they did was show Larry a picture of Jessica. Now, when they say that they showed Larry this picture of Jessica, he immediately flinched and turned away, which would be obviously a huge red flag. Allegedly, he put his hand over his face like he didn't want to see the picture, but then the investigators say that it was not long before Larry began to confess. He admitted that he had actually raped Jessica and that he strangled 
to her in the woods. He told the investigators that he laid 15 year old Jessica up against a tree. He put a belt around her neck and he strangled her until she stopped breathing. Larry admitted to hurting more women, including Trisha, who Larry identified by pointing at her picture. They laid out all of these photos of women that were missing, and Larry told the investigators, all of them. I can't remember all of them. I picked up several in other areas, but he told him that he couldn't remember which ones he had picked up and which ones he had hurt. So you can imagine, too, at this point, the investigators are probably a little frustrated because now he's admitting to the situation with Jessica. He's giving exact details of what he did to her. Then they're showing him these other photos and he's saying, yes, I, I did do this to Trisha. And then when he shows them all the photos, he goes, oh, all of them. I, I, oh, I did it to all of them. However, the very next day, Larry recanted all of his confessions. He told the investigators that he was just telling them about his dreams that he was having and that it never actually happened. So again, because Larry is a little different, okay? And he lies so much and has always lied so much. It's hard to tell what's the truth and what's not the truth, but these investigators know or they're feeling in their gut that they've got the right guy. I mean, everything lines up. The van, him being in the places where these people went missing at the same time, uh, witnesses that were seeing his van, but yet, He's confessing to this stuff and then recanting it and then saying that he felt under pressure. And it was even said that Larry began to confess to crimes that he never even did in order to throw the investigators off. Now, this could be considered wacky or it could be considered genius. Can you imagine? You have a person that snatches people and does these things. And when they're busted, they confess to it, but confess to a bunch of other stuff that they couldn't have possibly did. Therefore, that original confession that they gave looks like basically a crazy person just talking. This made it nearly impossible for the investigators to get a good confession from Larry that they could actually use against him in court. But nevertheless, they did not give up. And in 1995, Larry was indeed found guilty of kidnapping Jessica Roach and was sentenced to life in prison. Now, Larry was not actually charged for her murder. And this is because the investigators were not able to determine if Jessica was killed in Indiana or Illinois. But they knew it was him because he told how he did it and they were able to find Jessica's body one of the few bodies that they were actually able to find. There were still so many questions that were left unanswered though. Now something very interesting yet scary that happened was in the beginning, Larry's brother, Gary, was still trying to protect him. He just thought there was something wrong with him. He was weird. He, you know, never had a girlfriend. He had all these fantasies. And so maybe he was making up these fantasies in his head that he had done these things and maybe he didn't. And from what I've read about Gary in interviews that I've seen with him, and I think he's only done the one interview that I've seen, it's almost like he felt guilty because of what happened when they were in their mother's womb, which he shouldn't, but I guess I could, I guess I could understand. So he really tried to protect Larry for a long time. Now he changed later. Because of all of this, uh, Larry's brother Gary ended up hiring him a very good attorney and they appealed his case and they actually won one part of an appeal and investigators were getting very nervous that he would eventually get out for some reason. You know, that he was confessing to stuff that he didn't do and they couldn't really prove it because of this and because Gary told so many different stories, who knows what's the truth, is it with, with beyond a reasonable doubt? So the investigators knew that they had to do more. And this is when they decided that they needed to get somebody that was within the prison with him. Because at this time he was still in prison, but getting ready to go back for another appeal. The investigators wanted to get somebody inside there with him to see if they could get him to confess, tell where some of the bodies were or anything. This is when the investigators went and contacted a man named Jimmy Keen and you guys, this guy, Jimmy Keen, has the most interesting life story. I mean, I have gone so down the rabbit hole with things that he did when he was younger and how he used to get into trouble and how he got into this situation with Larry Hall. 
Very interesting, but to keep it short, Jimmy Keene began to sell substances when he was like very, very young. His father was like a long-term cop and he was always like in this lifestyle and he wanted more and more and more and he became very good at what he did. Again, a long story short, he ended up getting arrested, railroaded really for his charges and ended up getting sentenced 10 years to life on a conspiracy charge, okay? And the conspiracy charge was they didn't even have any real evidence against him. It was just word of mouth. And they sentenced him 10 years to life in prison, which means he goes in for 10 years. He gets into one fight, time goes up. Another fight, time goes up. And you know what I mean? So he was a smooth talker and he was somebody that could get along with anybody because he had been in this lifestyle for many years. This is when the DA, the prosecutor, approached Jimmy while he was in prison and they offered him a deal. They told him that if he would go undercover and get a confession from Larry, that he would be released and his record would be completely expunged. Now, before Jimmy accepted, they let him know that at that time, Jimmy was in a minimum security prison, basically a cupcake camp for prisons if you're going to have to be in a prison. If he accepted, he was going to have to be transferred to the same prison that Larry was being held in. And that was a maximum security prison that is for the criminally insane. Okay. This is the worst of the worst. It was deemed the place where they sent baby killers, the place with people with no souls and just a really bad maximum security prison. And the prison was in Springfield, Missouri. After Jimmy thought about it for a while and he learned a little bit, they told him a little bit about Larry's situation. The fact that he was doing this to young girls and da, 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 he decided to accept. Now, once he got there, he immediately went to work and tried to become friends with Larry. It's interesting though, because the prosecutors that were working with Jimmy, they had like this six month plan with him to become friends with Larry and not to, to move it too fast. But I listened to an interview with Jimmy where he said that basically the day that he got there, he saw Larry in the chow hall and he beeline to him. So again, you've got Larry who's never really had any friends. He's, you know, that socially awkward living in his own fantasies in his head. And Jimmy, who's like this buff, cool dude, who's like been running money schemes and is living this, has lived this lavish life before he got caught up in this conspiracy stuff. He goes up to Larry and he tells him that like, he's a cool dude. Well, Larry, you know, he's never had that before. He eats it up. Jimmy also told a story where he said that this is the point that he believed that Larry really began to trust him. Jimmy said that one day him, Larry, and some of the other inmates were like in the day area watching television. And on the television was like an America's Most Wanted and it was serial killer episode. So Larry's just sitting in there watching it, loving it. And another inmate that was in there, and he said it was a big, giant, buff inmate, just went up to the television, boop, and changed the channel. He said that when he changed the channel, Larry, being this, you know, again, awkward, socially awkward, you know, whatever type of guy, looks over at Jimmy and like mumbles, hey, I was watching that. Jimmy took this as his opportunity to show him like he was loyal to him. Jimmy said that he jumped up and long story short, he ended up getting in a fist fight with this dude, took him down, all this stuff. Jimmy gets thrown in the hole. And when he comes back out, Larry took to him like this. It was almost like Larry took to Jimmy like Jimmy was his twin brother, Gary. Later, at one point, Jimmy saw Larry in the prison workshop carving falcons, like the bird, falcons. And on these falcons, he had them positioned where they were looking over like this map. And the map had all of these red dots, like one in Indiana, da, 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 all over the place. According to reports, Jimmy said that when he went over to Larry and asked him about it, that Larry told him that these falcons 
watch over the dead, which made Jimmy believe that these marked spots on this map were the places that Larry had killed like all of these victims. At some point, Jimmy ended up talking to Larry and he could tell that Larry really took to him. He was with him all the time. He was following him around and he felt really protected by Jimmy. This is when Jimmy said to him like, hey, my mom saw some newspaper that you were in and it said you did all of these crazy things and da 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 and Larry got scared that he was going to lose Jimmy's friendship and he said, oh, they're lying on me. I didn't do that. This is what I did. And this is when Larry began to tell him about things that he had done. According to Jimmy, he would snatch these young girls and some of them he would dissolve their body into like acid and turn them into liquid and dig holes and pour it in there. Jimmy would later say in an interview that even if you went to some of these spots to look for their bodies, you would never find their bodies. If you dug up the dirt, you might find some sort of like DNA traces, but that you would never actually find the bodies because of what he did to them. At this point, Jimmy felt like he had solved like the case, like what had gone on and he had enough to prove to the FBI that he got enough to keep him basically in prison, keep Larry in prison. So he went to a phone and he called the FBI. Now, mind you, he had this deal with the FBI that after he got the information from Larry that they would have him out in 24 hours. But he called them, they didn't answer, and he left them a message. Now, after he left them this message, Jimmy was like boiling with everything that he had found out. And he went up to Larry and he confronted him. And it got so out of hand that they ended up throwing Jimmy into solitary confinement. Again, because he was in solitary confinement, he could not communicate with his outside sources. So he ended up staying in solitary confinement, even though he thought he was going to get out in 24 hours. The FBI allegedly didn't get the phone call. Because the FBI said that they did not get Jimmy's message, that gave Larry time to get rid of this map. So now Jimmy's sitting in the hole for two weeks, waiting to hear from somebody, like day, night, day, night. Larry's got time to get rid of all of his evidence. And by the time Jimmy, you know, gets out, Larry had gotten rid of the map. Because he was able to get information that the public would have never known about people that had went missing, the FBI did hold up their end of the bargain and they did end up getting Jimmy out and his, his deal was honored. The investigators still didn't have all the answers that they wanted from Larry. However, they were able to get enough information in order to keep him in prison for life. These are just some of Larry's suspected victims. 19-year-old Naomi Lee Kidder, 26-year-old Lolly Chavez, 10-year-old Linda Lynn, who went by Little Linda Weldy, 16-year-old Wendy Louise Felton, 19-year-old Paulette Sue Webster, 20-year-old Michelle Lee Dewey, and 22-year-old Lori Jean Deppies. Now again, these are just some of Larry's suspected victims. In total, they're rumored to be about 54. Now, I would hear later Jimmy say that he believed it was like in the 20s, the high 20s. He said that he confessed at least 20 different people to him, and he believed these confessions. And this is a man who says that he knows what it's like to look in a killer's eyes. And when Larry was confessing to him, treating him like he was his big brother, that he believed it. It would later come out that apparently when Larry was first arrested during a phone call with his brother Gary, he actually had asked Gary to have his father go to his house and burn all of the papers that he had around. Gary, his brother, would later say that he did see something that looked like a possible map with tons of red dots on it in the stuff that ended up getting burned. Last year, as of me filming this, in 2022, a crime drama miniseries called Blackbird came out that is based on Jimmy and Larry's relationship in prison. Now, this is a picture of the actor that plays Jimmy, and this is the real Jimmy Keen right here. And again, I've watched interviews with Jimmy, and I'm so glad that he was offered this deal and accepted it and was able to keep Larry behind bars. It's unimaginable to believe that he almost got out because he, you know, 
was the way that he was and he lied so much that he almost was rewarded for his lies. Can you imagine doing all of this stuff, sick as all get out, having these like weird like fantasies and fetishes and wanting to act them out and going out and, and doing it, flying under the radar because a lot of people in the town just thought he was harmless. They just thought he was the strange guy. But he, he, he wasn't, you know, just the strange guy. And then he would confess to it, but lie and confess to other stuff. And he almost got away with it. And he would have, without a doubt in my mind, he would have killed again. And I mean, like we just talked about, just one of those suspected victims was 10 years old. And no matter how old they were, I mean, they didn't deserve to go missing or end up in the way that they could have possibly ended up. And it's just so sad. So many of these families still to this day have no closure. And I don't think that they probably ever will. In one of the interviews, I heard Jimmy say that when he was talking to Larry in prison and when Larry would talk about the girls, he said that the way that Larry believed it in his mind was that the girls wanted it. And that like, he said that one time with one of them, he got so mad because she was crying for her mommy. And why, why would she do that? Can you, can you, that is just like mom, like crying out for her mother. And in his mind, it's like, why would she ruin the moment by calling for her mother? And Jimmy also said that Larry, the way that he talked about the women that he had done this to was he compared it to some like religions who believe that if you do certain things, you die and you go to heaven and you get all these virgins, right? He said that Larry, the way that he talks, he believes that all of these people that he did this to are waiting for him on the other side. And when he gets there, they're all going to be there waiting for him. Like he's got these fantasies going on in his mind. Sick, sick, sick. He never, ever, ever needs to get out or be around anybody ever again. And Gary, again, who felt bad and tried to protect him for a long time, once he started seeing all of these things, he realized that he, he didn't need to protect his brother and that his brother was sick. And as a matter of fact, in an interview that I listened to with Gary, he was, you know how like hindsight, you're, you're excusing things away because you think, oh, that person, he's got issues or he's strange or, you know, whatever. And then when he started realizing these things were true, then all of this stuff from his childhood started coming back. Gary said that he remembered he would wake up in the middle of the night and his brother Larry would be standing over him with like a big stick or something, just staring at him while he slept. And so he no longer tries to protect his brother, but he had to learn, unfortunately, you know, the, the hard way too. So have y'all heard about this case? Let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. What do I think? Again, I, I think that I, he never, ever, ever needs to get out. And I am so, so glad that Jimmy Keen was able to go in there and get the information that they needed so he could not get out on an appeal because he lies so much. Let me know what you guys think. I love y'all. Again, have a very, very, very Merry Christmas. Love your family members. Love your animals. And I will see y'all in the next video. Love you guys. Bye.